All right, guys. So welcome to the uh, second portion in the Gauss's law. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how can we use the knowledge that we just gained of how to calculate the electric flux. And the relationship between the flux is just the source of the, that flux. And the thing that generate those flux is just charges. I mean, there's, there's our charges that could be distributed around. So every time that you know that in some region in the space have some net flux, that is the evidence showing that there are some charges which is non-zero around that area as well. And when they say around, the Gauss's law say it has to be inside the area that you are talking about. So all the time, what we will be talking about is going to be a surface that is closed on itself. So it's going to wrap itself up in a balloon, okay? So if within this balloon shape or anything that has a closed surface, you have a net flux to be non-zero, that means inside that balloon, there must be some charges in there. That is, that, that is the, the, the main relationship between the flux and the charge. And this key relationship is the Gauss's law. And that's it. That is pretty much Gauss's law is saying here, right there. So if you know how to calculate flux, just like what we did, whoa, whoa, whoa. what happened here? Oh, there is something wrong with my file here. Okay. Um, what we say last time is, there you go. So we learned how to calculate flux throughout the closed surface. Once you know how to do that, which of course is the E and the surface area, right? That was what we tried to count. We tried to count the electric field lines. And then you sum over all the area. So this one is just in the form of the integral in the case that the area looks funny, doesn't look like easy, just like what we did last time. Last time we had like a, a cube, we have like a, a, a box. So it's sort of like you don't need integral, but if the area itself is like curved or whatever, something like that, you can use integration to help. But no matter what, the key concept stays the same. All you need is just to count the total electric field lines. Once you get that one, Gauss says those lines or those flux must come from charge inside. So that's why there is a word included included inside that closed surface. And to make units coincide with everything that we use, like SI system and everything, there is a constant showing up right here. And this constant right here, we call permittivity of free space, all right? And we briefly mentioned about the K has some relationship with this new constant right here, epsilon naught over here. And you can think of it as just like another, another constant but it has a close relationship with the K. You can re-express K in terms of one over four pi epsilon naught. That epsilon naught actually came from, now you know, right here from Gauss's law. That's it, okay? So we will see how you arrived at that K equal to one over four pi epsilon naught in just a second, all right? But you guys got the idea of what we are doing over here? I hope, all right. So if not, let's take a look at this. We saw some simulation last time. We can imagine what is going on right here again. Think of this. If you have a charge Q at the center of these three surfaces, S1, S2, and S3, okay? So you should be able to find the amount of flux. So let's say if I know how to calculate flux on S1, how much flux will be on S2 and S3? What do you think, guys? Correct. I don't know. I just read your mind. <laughs> what? Not what this question? They must be the same, right? They're all the same. You guys see what is going on right here? Because yeah. the lines act that piercing through S1 is actually piercing through S2 and S3. And if you try to count the amount of lines, they are all going to be the same. Why? Because S1, S2, uh, S2 and S3 include that charge Q in there 
And that is the only charge that these three surfaces can have inside its own surface. You guys with me now? And this is the reason why no matter what you try to do, you do the integral, you do everything, blah, blah, blah. At the end, the flux must be Q over epsilon naught and you're done. That sounds good. The flux linked directly to the charge inside that closed surface. No matter what shape the surface is, as long as you have the same amount of charge, you will get the same amount of flux. Is that cool? I think this is kind of cool. <laughs> and look on the right. This is the case that we did in the simulation last time. If you take the charge outside the closed surface, you will now bring that charge Q out of the balloon. You can see that there will be a portion of this one that the flux entering this surface and the other side will get out of it. And now you can guess the in must be perfectly canceled the out because you can see that there is nothing inside in here, nothing. There's no charge in the closed surface of this balloon. So the net flux must be zero because Q is zero. That's how simple it is. Isn't that cool? Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's check your understanding quickly and then I will bring you to like a real calculation. That, well, it's kind of bad in a way, right? Because, yeah, I, th I, I this lecture is supposed to happen on Wednesday, though. <laughs> it was like the plan was just, Wow, oh, because of that, we skipped the class on Monday. I, I didn't think that we're going to have to do this on Saturday. It's kind of bad because it's supposed to be like the peak of the stuff right here. So the figure shows in cross section, two Gaussian spheres and two Gaussian cubes. All right. So you can imagine this is like a three dimensional figure and um, that are centered on a positively charged particle. So you at the center of this four cross section uh, for closed surface, you have a positively charged particle sitting right there. Rank the net flux through these four Gaussian surfaces. All right. We will talk about what does it mean by Gaussian surfaces, but don't think too much. Actually, you can ignore this Gaussian adjective right here, but because you are trying to use Gauss's law and the surface that you are using next come from you yourself. <laughs> you have to imagine this surface okay. yourself. So that's why you just name this imaginary surface to be Gaussian surface. That's all. All right. So the Gaussian is just trying to emphasize that we are about to use Gauss's law. Okay, guys, what do you think? Which one will get the biggest amount of flux through? You have two spheres, the orange and the green, and two cubes, the blue and the purple. Ah, all right. So what all, zero. all zero. What about the rest? We have like two more people here. <laughs> okay. So the answer must not be zero. First of all, why? Because you already had some charge in there. You guys with me? It shouldn't be zero because inside these four surfaces, you have Q in it. Is that a good clue? Oh, I forgot to turn on the light. Yeah. Yeah. So at least all positive. That's good. That's good. Yeah, definitely. It's supposed to be positive because you have positive charge inside. So the electric field that coming out of it should just sort of like try to come out. And pretty much like, hey, I want to get out there. Hey, here we go. 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 With me? So at least you can imagine that the net flux is supposed to be positive in all four. But can you pinpoint the magnitude of it? Very good, very good. A, B, Z, and D. Yeah, the answer is they are all going to give you the same amount of flux. Can you see now when I draw those electric field lines? These four surfaces receive amount of the flux to be exactly the same. Why? Because all these four surfaces include the same amount of charge. 
I can even say the net flux on these four surfaces going to be the charge over epsilon naught, and I'm done. That's how simple this law is. If you can just look into, I mean, the inner volume of this closed surface and just say, hey, how much charge you get, that will link you to the flux through that surface already by taking those charge Q divided by epsilon naught and you're done. So the answer is all four, same. All the same. Okay, cool. Try again. All right, so this page, you don't need to read it. I think the best way to learn about how to use Gauss's law is just to apply it directly. And I'm going to show you how it's done. Here we go. Let's start from this, all right? And it's gonna be like a wow, wow, wow moment, guys. <laughs> wow. Okay, you have a charge Q right here, all right? We sort of familiar with this already. I wanna try to apply Gauss's law. And because I only have like a point charge Q sitting right here, so what I'm going to do is, okay, we, we, we name this process saying that we are going to take advantage of symmetry of the system. When it says symmetry, means you are thinking about this charge and what kind of symmetry that this charge has. And it turns out, well, John, it's just a point. When it's a point, it means when you look around everywhere from this point, they all look the same to you. This one, we say that this point charge will have a spherical symmetry. Does that sound good? Okay, okay. When it says sim spherical symmetry, what does it mean? It means no matter which direction you try to do something about this charge, no matter which direction, which it will have the same effect. They will all look the same. So that leads you to create a Gaussian surface to wrap this charge, that surface we already named Gaussian surface, to be in the shape of a sphere. Does that sound reasonable? Why is it so? Because by using just the symmetry argument, I can say if there were to be any electric field on this, no matter where you are on this sphere, you would get the same amount of the electric field. Does that make sense? Because of the symmetry alone. You don't need to think of anything else. There shouldn't have any particular direction that has an electric field stronger than the other direction because they all look the same. Okay? So that's how you come up with the shape of the Gaussian surface. All right, is that cool? All right, now, second step. So once you already decided the shape of the Gaussian sphere, it has to be like, okay, a sphere. Next, I am going to calculate the flux through this sphere, throughout the surface of the sphere, okay? So now it's time to apply what we learned last time. What we learned last time was like, okay, Ajahn, I already saw this is an electric field that's supposed to be same magnitude in all directions. So that blue arrow is just the direction of the electric field. And last time, the concept of the flux is just the field penetrating through a surface. And now because the surface is sort of like curved, so I'm going to just chop this into a tiny piece. And I'm going to call this like a meet neat surface, DA. But we already knew how to define the direction to this surface. I'm just build a vector that point perpendicular to the actual surface. So this is my DA vector. Make sense? Very cool. So what is going to be total flux on this DA surface? Well, Ajahn, no problem. I'm going to call this flux like a meet neat one, D flux. And it'll be equal to vector E, that's the electric field, dot with the DA vector, that's already the area vector that we just built. And because you can see from the symmetry and everything, electric field is supposed to point out in the radial direction. It's a radial symmetry. And the surface of the sphere should have the area vector pointing out perpendicular to its own surface. And that means it's already in the radial direction also. This leads to the parallel directions between E and DA. Nice. It's the cosine zero. So that means I can say right away that the flux that is going through this DA is just E DA. Whoa, done. Okay. Cool.
So what you have left to do is just I'm going to have to do this everywhere on this sphere. Just slice this into a tiny piece everywhere. Shump, 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 shump. But then you can imagine now, no matter where you are on this sphere, the DA will always point perpendicular to the surface. So that means it's going to point in the radial direction. The electric field itself is going to point in the radial direction anyway. So that means no matter which piece of the DA that you cut, you will always see that, oh, okay, the DE, oops, sorry, the E, and the DA will always be parallel to each other. So that means wherever you look at, the flux always E DA. With me, guy? On this sphere. So all I need now is just like, okay, John, I want them all. So I'm just going to just sum them all. Just add those flux, D phi, the D flux everywhere. And just to emphasize that I'm going to do over a closed surface, I'm just going to put like a circle on top of this integral sign just to emphasize that this is the surface integral on a closed surface. Sounds good. And I hope now you can read this line right here. See, exactly the same. That is the total amount of flux needed here. All right, so I hope this showcase how this first line is sort of like forming up. You have a flux total equal to E dot DA sum everywhere on a closed surface. That's what it means. However, now E and DA are already parallel. We already showed you that. It's just the EDA. Now, next step is simple. Because of the symmetry again, no matter where you talk about the magnitude of the E on this surface, they must have the same size, same strength, same magnitude. So that means that E can be pulled out from the integral because it's just a constant throughout this surface. What you have left is just the sum of all that DA, that mini tiny surface, bep, 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 DA. So what is the sum of this DA, 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 DA on this sphere? Of course, it's going to be the surface area of the sphere, 4 pi r squared. You guys with me? Cool. So that's it. So this integral gives you E 4 pi r squared. That's your net flux on this surface. Done. Well, it sounds like a long process, but actually once you understand how to do this a couple of times, then it's going to take you like 10 seconds. <laughs> but first time seeing this, like, okay, so it's been 10 minutes on it. Okay, that's done. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll discuss about what if you have other shapes. All right. So that's just the net flux. Now, let's attach that Gauss's law on top of this. Gauss says, hey, if you know the flux on a closed surface, that flux must be equal to the charge inside that surface divided by epsilon naught, correct? That's what we have. How much charge are you looking at? Ajahn, that is Q right there. That's it. That's the only charge that included inside this sphere. And that's it. You divide it by epsilon naught. You're done. That is your. Okay. And can you see something now? By looking at this, I can move things around a bit. But Ajahn, I can use this equation to figure out what should be the E. And then I can just move this 4 pi r squared to your right. So E is just 1 over 4 pi. Let me combine this with the epsilon naught. Q is up top, R squares right here. Do you see what we're seeing over here? That is the Coulomb's law, guys. Okay. okay. I hope this sort of like give you, like come into a full circle that this is the equivalent between the Coulomb's law and the Gauss's law. And now it reveals why that four pi epsilon naught eventually will be just K. All right, because of this. Gauss's law right here. Isn't that cool? All right. So this is how it's done. And because we are not going to try to 
sort of like, you know, go crazy with that. And this will answer the question about what, how will it work? If it's a cube, it will work, but your job will be much more difficult. The reason for that is because if you put a charge cube in a box, in a cube, the problem is the cube is kind of, even though it looks symmetry, like it has a high symmetry, it looks symmetric. However, the magnitude of the electric field on the cube is not that nice. Okay, look at this. If I have a positive charge right here and it plays a cube on top of this, I mean, not on top, but at least like surround this. So as you can see that you can do it, but now the argument that the magnitude of the electric field on the surface of the box will be crazy because electric field here will like, okay, kind of strong here. But then we go to what the corner is kind of like, it's kind of weaker because it's further away. And now you're going to have problem with the direction because there will be some angle over here. So as you can see, the mathematics will be quite crazy if you try to apply uh, Gauss's law in the case of a point charge when you have a surface in the shape of a cube. You guys with me now? The reason that you make your life difficult here because you are not using the symmetry that the point charge has. The point charge has a spherical symmetry. It looks nice in all directions. But then you try to cover them with a box with different type of symmetry. So that's why it doesn't work well. So does that make sense now? Okay. So if you go back here, here. Yeah. So that's why there's a first comment on the previous slide saying that the Gauss's law is works really well in a high degree of symmetry problem. Okay. So I mean it's super, it's gonna be super symmetric problems for you to be able to apply Gauss's law, at least by hand. Okay. Of course, if you use computer simulation and all this stuff, all right, that's a different story because you can calculate everything using numerical calculations. But if you want to do it by hand, just to understand the principle and everything, want to do the analytical approach to the problem, you need a high degree of symmetry problems to be able to do it on the paper. Okay, so that's answer your question. Like, yeah, use more simulation is kind of nice. However, if you uh, didn't get the fundamental understanding of those whole thing, then it's going like, to it's gonna look nice on the simulation and everything, but by having a chance to do it by hand first, I think that's going to be like, it's, it's going to stuck into your head a little bit deeper, I guess. <laughs> okay. okay. So that's my take on it. All right, guys. So if you're still sort of like, okay, I kind of get it, but it's like, I'm not getting it per se. So we will do a lot more, a lot when I say a lot more, it's like three, four more exercises that utilize this spherical symmetry. I'm going to stuck with the spherical symmetry first for you to be able to sort of like get familiar with the whole thing. Okay. Try this. All right, you're gonna like keep doing this until you get sick of this. All right, you're gonna throw up in the Gauss's law, whatever stuff here. <laughs> okay, look at this. Now we're gonna extend the idea. Okay, Dan, it seems to work well with the point charge. It's spherical symmetry and everything, it looks nice. What about if I have a solid sphere instead? So now you have a chunk of charge. It doesn't have to, it's just like not only just a point, but now you come like a ball. So we have a charged ball. Radius A, oh, all right, A or R. Okay, let's use R then. Okay, because there you go. Sorry about that. Okay, so you have a solid sphere of radius, capital R, has a uniform charge distribution. So that's good. So at least it's saying that the charge distribution on this ball is just uniform everywhere. It's kind of nice and smooth. And the charge density now is given to be rho. So the total amount of charge on this ball, you can calculate very easily because every time you look at the density, it means it's going to be the charge in the 3D charge per volume. Good. So that means if you know the volume, you just multiply by the row, you get back the total amount of charge Q. So that's check. Okay, done. No big deal. Now, find the electric field outside. I want to know what's outside. Back in the day, if you just want to use Coulomb's law, things will go crazy. Because if you really want to apply just a pure Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law, then you have to use like 
big calculus stuff. Can you see? Because you just said, okay, Dan, I'm going to slice this into a tiny piece. I'm going to call this like a mini Q here, a tiny chart. And if I'm standing right at some point away outside of the ball, there will be an electric field coming from that mini DQ that we are going to call this like a DE, something like that, right? Sort of. And then you say, okay, I move on to a next DQ. And then what I'm going to get is it's going to generate another DE over here. And then they move on to the next DQ. <laughs> and then you just start to see, like, okay, it's going to generate like a mini DE over there. I move on to that different position there. This will generate another DE right there. See, it seems like an impossible task for you to do because you have to collect all the DE coming from all the DQ inside this ball of charge. Who would want to do this? <laughs> I don't want to do it. It's too hard. Even though like in principle, you know how it's done. You can set up just like a simple, you know, integration in your mind, but you cannot execute it. It's just too much. The angle, the three-dimensional problems go crazy. All right. So forget about this. It's impossible for you to do. Okay. Or maybe you have a way of doing it. Just let me know. But for me, it's just like, okay, it won't work. However, it is a sphere. The ball is a spherical ball. So it has spherical symmetry again. When I say spherical symmetry, what does it mean? It means if I am standing at a point outside the ball, let's say at the distance or away from the center of the ball, it doesn't matter where I am. As long as I am sitting on the surface of this sphere, I will look at the ball the same. I cannot distinguish one point to another point. You guys with me? And that because of the spherical symmetry. You imagine like if this ball is Earth, then you will say, okay, I, I can say I am standing at a different position because when you look at the Earth, you look at the surface, you can see, okay, that's Thailand. That's maybe like ocean, you know, that's Antarctica or whatever, because the surface of the earth is non-uniform. It looks like you have a pattern in something that you can sort of identify where you are, right? But then if the earth is just like clean like this, it's like a single color ball. <laughs> when you're flying away in, in the sky at some elevation on top of the surface of the earth, you won't be able to tell where you are. Because when you look down, it's like, okay, it's like orange color. You cannot tell where you are. That's what it means by spherical symmetry. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So that's what it means. Now you have spherical symmetry. This suggests that you should use a Skousen surface to be in a shape of a sphere again. So what I'm doing is I'm going to wrap this ball of charge with a sphere because I want to be outside of this sphere, uh, spherical ball. So I'm going to create a Gaussian surface that is larger than the charge ball itself. Okay. Just like in the figure show. And on this one, just pure symmetric arguments alone, I can say that on this surface, electric field supposed to point in the radial direction because there shouldn't have any other direction that looks better than any other direction because of the spherical symmetry, guys, right? That makes sense. Okay, that's good. That is the same argument that we use no matter when, no matter where, no matter how. <laughs> I don't care as long as you have spherical symmetry. It should look the same in all directions. Second stuff, you say, okay, Wherever you are on this Gaussian sphere, I'm going to calculate the flux through this sphere. So I'm going to chop this into a tiny piece again. That tiny piece of area will have the surface area of dA because it's going to have the vector pointing away from it in the perpendicular direction. So this dA vector will point in the radial direction as well. So once again, you arrive at the same condition of the E vector and the DA vector are pointing in the same direction. Cool. So that means I can say that the flux on this one that you can name a mini flux, D flux, is going to be E dot with the DA, but because they are parallel already, so it's going to be E DA. I can add cosine zero to it, just emphasize that there's nothing there. That's fine. 
And now what you have to do next is just, I'm going to have to do this on every piece of this DA on this sphere. DA, 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 DA. See, I'm saying exactly the same thing as the previous problem. Okay, so what you have over here is now you can use this expression to express the mini flux on each piece of the surface on this Gaussian sphere. So what you need is just sum them up. So that's it, guys. So you know how to read this. The net flux on the Gaussian sphere is going to be E dot DA. You're going to sum everywhere. So let me emphasize this by looking this integral again. Let me put a circle on top because I'm going to do on all over the closed surface. In this case, it, in the shape of a sphere. And then E dot DA is just E DA. And once again, because let me put like a sort of like a detour over here, because once again, E is constant. Okay, let me write one like this E DA. And because E is constant, I can pull it out from the integral. And because of this integral of the DA across the surface, it's just the surface of the sphere, I get 4 pi r squared. And that's it. I'm done. You guys with me? That is the next flux on this Gaussian sphere that we just built. Now that's the left side of the Gauss's law. What about the right side? Gauss said, whatever you got on the left in terms of the net flux, just find the charge inside that Gaussian sphere. How much charge is inside this Gaussian sphere? But then it's the whole ball right here. So the net charge inside is just capital Q, check. With me? And you just divide this by epsilon naught and you're done. That's the Gauss's law, guys. Okay. And because this allows you to calculate the E, what should be the E, I can just move four pi r squared to the right again, and then I arrive at this. It looks the same. It looks like Coulomb's law. <laughs> so that's good. So what the results that you get right here is me, it's trying to say that even though it's not a point charge anymore, if the charge is now big in the shape of a ball, you still get the Coulomb's law anyway. Okay, so that means as long as the charge retain the spherical symmetry, that's fine. Everything looks good. Still usable. Coulomb's law is still nice. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Question. no problem. But in real life, when you have a, a object, a 3D object with a star, it on, the star only appears on the outside, on the surface. But in ah, the inside... That's a good question. We will, we will comment on that in a little bit. Okay, very good. But this one, they said, because the problem specifically say that is uniform distributed. What does it mean to be uniform? I mean, it's everywhere, both inside and outside, not only just on the surface. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But because you already asked, so let me just answer you quickly. So this is an insulator. Think of it that way. So when you say insulator means when you put a charge on the insulator, it doesn't move. So that means you can pretty much like spread the charge everywhere evenly across the volume of this whole thing. So does that make sense? That's what it means by uniformly distributed. So there are charge with the same amount, same density everywhere on this charge ball. Okay, but it won't work if this is like a conductor. So we'll we'll make a comment on that. What's the difference between when you're dealing with an insulator and when you deal with a conductor? Right, you get a different sort of like a result at the end. But for now, let's assume that it's uniformly distributed throughout the volume. Okay, sounds good. All right, and the, okay, let's come back to this one. And next over here, it's nothing more than just you can re-express. It depends on what kind of information you have. Because the problem in this uh, that you are looking at right now, they give you the information about the row, not the queue. So all you need to do is just replace the queue in terms of the row that you already built in the first line over there, okay? So you can replace queue with that row times the volume of the whole sphere. So you can just plug it in here if you like. Okay, but it's just the same thing. Okay, either one, you get the same answer anyway. 
Okay, sounds good. So it's not that bad, yeah. Even though it's sort of like okay, kind of weird in a way if this is first time seeing the Gauss's law. But once you see these two exercises, now you can see okay, that's kind of easy to apply. Try to figure out the flux. That's what we have been doing in the last time. And then once you're done with that, apply Gauss's law by just looking for the amount of charge included inside a closed surface. That is it. Okay, try again. This one is harder, same ball. But now the question asking you to figure out the charge, I'm sorry, asking you to figure out the electric field inside the ball, not the outside anymore. How would you do it, guys? You want to give it a try? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Okay, so because of the spherical symmetry, Mo'atan, I don't know what else to imagine except just a sphere again. But yeah, you are right. That is correct. Okay. okay. You just figure out that the Gaussian surface that you need is going to be in the shape of a sphere again. But now the sphere is going to be smaller than the ball itself because you want to figure out what is going on inside. But then you use the same argument because once we sort of like forget about Coulomb's law, forget about anything, you only do this this symmetry argument. You only just say, okay, because of this is symmetry like this, because you have this kind of symmetry, and then that, dot, that, you don't have to think in terms of the Coulomb's law whatsoever. Okay, does that make sense? So can we just imagine a smaller ball? No, no, um, so the ball has to be the same size because that's what is given to us. So what we have to imagine is that the Gaussian sphere is actually smaller than the ball. Okay, because if you shrink down the ball again, then it won't be the same ball anymore. <laughs> okay, all right. So with the same argument, you will say that the electric field on this sphere should still be symmetrical around this. No problem. And you sort of like get sick of this one more time. As long as it is a sphere, the surface area that you get out of this one will be in the radial direction as well. So this means the DA will also point in the same direction everywhere. My red arrow is the DA right there. Cool. So that means what you get is, okay, let me write E, electric field is pointing in the radial direction. Mini surface areas also point in the same direction. So mini flux on this mini area is going to be E dot with the DA. Okay, this is the third time doing this. It's a DA. E D A cosine zero and it's just E D A again. Okay. What one what else do you want? You want them all. So what I want is just I'm just gonna sum them up everywhere. Okay. And we will because we would do it over a closed surface. Let me put like a circle sign on top of that. Once you're done with this, that is your net flux on this Gaussian sphere. Cool. Done. Okay, so now you know how to read this. The next flux is just an integral E dot dA across this closed surface. And just quick D2 over here is going to be integral E dA. E supposed to be the same everywhere on this surface. And that's what you get right there. The integral of the surface pieces dA is going to give you back 4 pi r squared anyway. And that's it. That is the total amount of flux on this. Isn't that cool? But now what you have left to do is the right-hand side. How much charge should you put in this right side of the Gauss's law? What is going to be the charge that is included inside your Gaussian sphere? You're right. Okay. You just have to take into account just the charge within this Gaussian sphere right here. You guys with me now? Which is not the whole ball. No. So if you think like the whole ball is like a big scoop of ice cream, so what you are having right now is like a smaller scoop inside. So that means the amount of ice cream you are getting is going to be smaller than the whole scoop. Yeah, does that make sense? So that's what you get. The only question is how much are done? Well, oh, that's easy. Because you know the charge density is given to be rho. So you just take the density and then multiply by the volume that you want. The small scoop has a radius of the small r. So you just take four third pi mini r cube. That is your volume of that mini scoop of the charge. 
that you want. This is the amount of charts that included inside your Gaussian Sophia at this point. And that's it, guys. Pretty much done. I can move 4 pi r squared to the right and re-express e. It's going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Just pull them out. r squared is still there. That's coming from r squared on the left. 4 pi r cubed times rho. I mean, 4 thirds, sorry. 4 third pi r cubed times rho. That is the charge enclosed inside this Gaussian sphere. Done. That's it. What do we cancel? Cancel. R square cancel out two of them. So I left with one R. I keep this constant in the front just, just because it's, it's a sort of like standard way of writing this thing. So you have four pi R rho over three. And that's it, guys. You're done. Okay. okay. Isn't that cool? The result. Look at the result, guys. Here. Ta See, electric field inside the ball is linearly retained on the distance from the center of the ball. Isn't that good? Good, in the sense that that means if you are standing at the center, of course, that makes sense. You're not supposed to feel any electric field because you get perfect cancellation of the electric field from all directions around you. Does that make sense? Okay. But when you move away from the center, it turns out the electric field gets stronger and stronger linearly until you reach the surface of this ball. And one thing that is nice about this one is if you try to calculate electric field when the distance is equal to capital R, that is the size of the ball itself, you just substitute the whole thing, not the whole thing, sorry, substitute the mini R to be the capital R. And then the row, the row itself is just Q over 4 third pi capital R cube. You guys with me? <laughs> just like go back and forth, back and forth now. All right, 4 pi over 3, just cancel. Uh, just cancel one of them left with just two. You are left with just 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught and then Q over R squared, which is nice. Why? This has to be exactly the same as the one that you got here when you are sitting at the surface of the ball. I mean, the results from inside and outside calculation should coincide at the surface. Does that make sense? Otherwise, then you get a jump of the electric field at the surface of the ball, which doesn't make sense. Electric field cannot just jump. The value is supposed to be continuous, yeah? So if you substitute that small r to be capital R, you should get back KQ over R squared, which is the same result coming from the first portion of this problem. Okay, so in conclusion, what I can sort of like draw for you guys is this. If I draw the magnitude of the electric field, this is the radius of, I mean, the distance from the center of the ball. This is the capital R. So what you're getting right now, the conclusion is electric field when distance is zero is zero. And then when you walk away from it, the electric field gets stronger and stronger when you're reaching the surface of the ball. But once you hit the surface of the ball and you try to move, may fly away from the ball, the whole thing will run out. I mean, run down as one over R squared. Does that make sense now? All right, this gives you the whole picture of what is going on on a charged ball. <laughs> All right, it sounds like weird and all, but I mean, if you imagine that we imagine this since beginning of this electric theory discussion, you can imagine this to be exactly the same as a G, right? Because we do the analogy all the time, electric fields behave exactly the same as the gravitational fields. So actually these techniques can go back and allow you to explain what should be the gravity inside the surface of the earth. Exactly the same. So it's mean, I mean, assuming that the earth is perfectly round. So that means if you're standing at the center of the earth, which you cannot, <laughs> you should feel no gravity because the mass of the earth in all directions will pull you exactly the same and you get perfect cancellation. But once you move away from the center of the earth toward the surface, the gravity will increase, increase, increase. And once you reach the surface of the earth, you should get 9.8 meter per second square approximately. And once you fly up into the sky, then the gravity will dying down as one over R squared. 
So it will use exact same explanation. And then you actually, you can use Gauss's law for gravity as well, even though we don't have that. I don't, I don't think we need that, I guess. Yeah, that's why we don't learn Gaussian, Gauss's law for gravity or something. All right, but the concept stays the same. Okay, sounds good. All right, there's a question, special question. What if the charge is located on the exact between inside and outside? I, well, don't think too much yet. Let's face the next one. I think this might answer your question. <laughs> All right, let's do this one and then we'll take a break. Sounds like a plan. All right. I mean, if you already finished this one, that's all I ask you to do for the spherical symmetry problem. You have a thin spherical shell of radius A, has a total charge Q distributed uniformly over its surface. I don't know would this help or not, but instead of having charge located exactly between inside and outside, this one go very close to what you're asking. I have just have a thin shell. So it's like, it's a shell. Now, okay, let me use like, okay, blue will maybe better. Okay, here we go. So you have a shell. So it's like a void inside. It's kind of blank inside. And then you say that the amount of charge Q distributed on it is Q. So this is just like a thing of like a surface charge. So this will answer part of your question. Like, hey, Ajahn, what happened if the charge just only stay on the surface, okay? This is what the case. So you have like a super thin shell, okay? But now we still assume that the Q is distributed equally everywhere on this shell. Find the electric field once again, outside and inside, guys. You wanna try? Yeah? <laughs> All right, first thing first, but Ajahn, it's a sphere. So what kind of Gaussian surface should I pick besides Saphir? The answer is no. You should pick Saphir anyway. Let's do it then. So outside, what you have to do is just you're going to wrap this with a larger Saphir. That is your Gaussian surface. Okay, so this is your Gaussian surface. All right, you're going to start to sort of like, okay, I know how to do this now. Electric field on this one is supposed to point radially outward due to the spherical symmetry. Surface area on this surface is also point in the radial direction because it is a sphere. So I can now write down the net flux on this Gaussian sphere is going to be E dot with the DA and sum everywhere on this sphere. Does that make sense now? It looks better. Okay. And because E and DA are pointing in the same direction, I just write E DA cosine zero. Very good. And because of the spherical symmetry, the electric field on this Gaussian surface is supposed to have the same magnitude in all directions. I can pull E outside. Very nice. And the sum of the DA is nothing more than just the surface of the Gaussian sur surface itself. So if I take this Gaussian sphere to have the radius of small r, so the integral of the DA will be 4 pi r squared. That is the surface of the sphere of radius r. Done. That's it's a net flux on this Gaussian sphere. I just equate this to what, guys? Ta -da -ta -ta. What should be put in here before divided by epsilon naught? You just have to put the charge that is inside this Gaussian sphere. And how much is that? Well, done. But there's nothing more than just Q right there. Yeah, that's all you have to do. Just put it in there. And that's it, you're done. Okay. So I can say this is the E outside. So let me put the subscript out just to emphasize what we're doing over here. Okay, let me move up a bit. E outside at this point is just one over four pi epsilon naught Q over R squared. And once again, guys, it looks just like Coulomb's law again. So now you start to see the conclusion now no matter you have a point charge, a ball, solid ball, and now you have like a thin shell. As long as you are away from it, Coulomb's law works. Nice. That's nice and clean. <laughs> okay. 
But then what I'm going to try to do one more time is what about inside the shell, Mo Chan? If you want inside, you just draw a Gaussian surface to be smaller. That's your Gaussian surface again. Okay. And the argument about the electric field and the surface vector will look exactly the same. The electric field is supposed to point out. The A is supposed to point out in the same direction because it's just spherical symmetry. So the left side of this whole thing will look exactly the same. So let, this is outside. So let me do inside. Okay, well done. Net flux on this Gaussian surface, the mini one now, it's still E dot DA integrates them over that mini sphere in there. But because E and DA are parallel to each other, I can say it's an E DA cosine zero. I'm just going to keep writing until you get sick of this. All right. And that's what you get is just E DA. But because E is constant, I can pull it out from the integral. The integral of the DA is nothing more than just the surface area of the sphere four pi R squared. Whoa, that's almost done. All you have to do is just equate to what? Charge, and then you divide it by epsilon naught, correct? So what should you put in this box on the right? What is the net charge inside that smaller Gaussian surface now? Yeah, you're right. Very good. Okay. okay. You don't see anything. There's no charge in there, John. And that's it, guys. So E inside is zero. Done. Okay. See, this is how simple this is going to All you care about is, are there any charges inside the Gaussian surface? If there's none, you put zero in there. And that's it. This sort of explaining some sort of like an effect. Whenever you have like a, 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 a shell of charge, you can use that as a shielding. <laughs> it's shield. It's like a shield. So it's protect you from the electric field. <laughs> Think of it that way. So that's what it is. It's sort of like a sense of this saying that if you get lightning strike and you are sitting in the car, as long as you don't have any part of your body touching the metal part of the, the, the car body, you should be safe. <laughs> because electric field inside a metal box is supposed to be zero. All right, but in reality, it might not work perfectly well because... I don't know, there will be some leak because the current is super high. So there might be some sparks, some, I don't know, there's some weird stuff going on with the air around you. But in a normal case, in general, when you are inside a charged box or a charged cage, the fields inside seem, I mean, it's going to go to zero. And this is a part of, part of the reason because we are not doing this for the communication. But when you get into the elevator, usually the phone signal disappear, right? So that's what pretty much what it is. It seems like electric field inside like a, a metal uh, cage that you are in in the elevator will not allow the electric field to penetrate in. All right, but this is just a part of it because um, the the uh, electromagnetic wave that you use for the communication is is a dynamic stuff, right? It's not what we're doing here. Is a, static but at least it has some relationship and it can lead you to the conditions that what's going on on the surface of the metal something like that okay sounds good all right so what you have done is five times <laughs> see you have done gauss's law five times in the past hour you did with the point charge two for the ball solid spherical ball inside and outside and now you have uh, thin spherical shell inside and outside. They all look the same, see? So you have already done five applications of the Gauss's law. <laughs> five applications. Yeah, you can call one application, but do it five times. Okay, so the question, are you going to ask electric field in non? No, no, no way. All right, so don't worry about it. This one, even though, I mean, the, the law looks cool and all, but it won't work when you have a very low symmetry system. It's, it's too hard to do by hand. So don't worry. All right. I'm just going to, it's either like a sphere or it's going to be what you're going to see next. It's going to be simple, like a line, a cylinder, and that's it. All right. We're not going to do anything crazier than this. Okay. 
All right, sounds like a good point to break, I guess. But I think at least that's the part that I would would like to deliver. And I think this is the peak of the whole course, pretty much. You try to sort of, you know, all right, showcase the the law, and it's a very important one if you have to continue studying electromagnetic stuff. Right, this is one of the big four equations and all this stuff. All right, guys, let's take a break right here, and then after the break, we'll bring you a little bit further. How can we use this in some other stuff? All right, and it's gonna be fun, I guess. <laughs> all right, see you in a bit. Okay. okay. First. Okay, so welcome back to this uh, Gauss's law business, and what we are about to learn next is about a device that actually is very important in um, electronics and everything, industry and every and all the industrial stuff that we are using. It's called capacitor, and as the name imply, imply, it's a device that has an ability to store charge. That's it. That's why it has some capacity to store charge. So we name it a capacitor, and the parameter that's used to sort of like indicates how well that capacitor can store charges is named capacitance. That's it. Okay, so it's kind of like okay, name is pretty good. Okay, but however, how does it work? How can you store charge in a device? The concept is very simple, because when you want to deal with this charge and you want to store it, that means there must be some charge movement, correct? So that means you are trying to think of something that has like the ability to conduct electricity. So that's why you can think of you have two pieces of Stuff that can conduct electricity. All right, and that's a good question. What's the difference from battery? I will answer that after we introduce the uh, infrastructure of the capacitor. Thank you for the question. It's a good one. All right. So over here, of course, at first, it's gonna be just like a neutral piece of metal. Let's think of it that way. All right. And the way that you can make it store charge is you just Remove charge from one piece and deposit onto the other. Does that sound reasonable? The way that you can do that is just by applying voltage difference. For example, you can just put like a battery on here. All right, anything that can generate potential difference. Once you do that, then what you are doing is just you're going to transfer. I mean, the charge will start to move from high to low if you think of a positively charged particle. So the positive charge will move from high potential to the low potential. So eventually, what you get is the charge will uh, deposit onto one, and the other one that loses the charge will get more negative. So at the end, what you get over here is just there will be a positively charged conductor on the left in this case, and you're going to have a negatively charged on the right with the same amount. Because you seems it's just what you did is just you steal the charge from one piece of the conductor and deposit onto the other. Does that sounds good? All right. So the sum of the whole charge is still supposed to be zero because all you do is just move from one plate to the other. And the basic construction of this one that you can do and it has a very simple shape. It's just like two flat sheets of conductor. That's it. <laughs> Something like that. And that's what we're gonna learn. Okay. So. How much can you store on it? Now it depends on. All right, now you can see what John. You have to move the charge, so you need to apply the voltage difference across these two pieces of conductors. And of course, what you care so much about this one is how much charge can you store. So that's it. A simple concept of this one is just okay, John. I'm gonna just tell you how well this device can store charge by just take the ratio between. The amount of charge that you can store, you can just pick one Q because one must be positive, the other one is negative. So you just take the magnitude of the charge, and then divided by how much voltage different that you have to apply, like how much trouble you have to go through bringing the charge from one piece to the other. That, that sounds good. And then you define this one as a capacitance, and that's it, guys. Done. Okay. And I'm not so sure why. <laughs> In the topic of circuits analysis and all the current flow and other stuff, they prefer to not drawing or not writing that delta sign anymore because I think it shows up 
too many places and then I think they're just too lazy to type that delta anymore. So I guess everyone understand that even though you see just only the V, it means the potential difference because we already discussed about what the V purely means. Usually it's like doesn't exist much except when you do like a KQ over R. But even KQ over R formula, you still have the relative calculation with respect to the charge at infinity, right? Sort of like you are so far away from it and you call this like a zero potential. So it's pretty much like every time that you use potential, you always use potential difference. Okay, so we drop the delta by knowing that it's always some delta in the front. So on the other way around, you can re-express this equation and say the amount of charge that you can store in the capacitor with the capacitance C is going to be just multiplied by the potential difference V that you put across that capacitor. Done. Okay. And then when you look at the unit, it's going to be Coulomb per volt. And this Coulomb per volt has a special name called Farad, right? So it's in honor of Michael Faraday. So we say it's a Farad. So that's the unit of capacitor. Sounds good? All right. Now, when you look at this one, Mojan, when you really want to use this one, how you use it, of course, you just disconnect this because once you already charged, so you can just disconnect this whole thing, ready to use. All right, just remove this circuit that used to charge. So the process of having the charge from zero all the way to the value of the charges you want, you call it a charging process, just like you're charging like a battery, same thing. But then when you want to use it, you just attach this to external circuit that you want to apply something to. Let me put, it could be like a whatever. And then this whole thing will start to discharge. So what is the difference between this kind of discharge and the one that your friend just asked? What about battery? Battery also give off charges as well. So the difference is this. This capacitor will discharge depends on the outside circuit. And in general, the capacitor try to take out the charge as, as it can. <laughs> There's no control. There's nothing in the way that you can control it. It depends on what kind of circuit that this capacitor is attached to. But the battery though, but the battery that you use is already fixed at, for example, like a double A, triple A battery is like a 1.5 volt. So for the battery, it has a controlled voltage output. All right. And you use like a chemical reaction and stuff like to control that. Okay. You guarantee that you're going to get like about 1.5 volts on the way out constantly. Okay. So that is the difference in terms of how you generate the voltage difference. For the battery, you use uh, chemical reactions, plus you supply constant voltage throughout the usage of the battery. But for the capacitor, it's just the charge storing it. And when it's going to get discharged, it depends on what you're going to connect this capacitor with. It has some characteristic of this that will not be a constant voltage. Okay, does that help? Okay, so the capacitor will shock you more. Yes, not only more, it's very dangerous, guys. So that's why I put some figure over here just so you can see that you, I think you probably have seen this many, many places. Um, a small one you see in like a motherboard, mainboard PC or some electronics device on the stuff. All right, but that will be like a big chunk, like equal to like the size of your arms. Oh, you don't see me. I forgot to turn on the video. Sorry. <laughs> so that'll be like a big piece, like, you know, like a big chunk of it. The bigger the capacitor, the more dangerous it gets because it means that it can store a lot of charge in there. All right. So yeah, you can get knocked out by it. I mean, it's, you can just go black right away if you touch it and it is discharged on you. It's very dangerous. Okay. And one example of the application of this one is the defibrillator, the one that you put on the patient's chest and then you discharge on it to just to jumpstart the heartbeat and all this stuff. Yeah, that's, yeah, taser gun. Well, but the taser gun is, yeah, it's, it's, it's well, it, it's not a capacitor discharge though, but the taser gun is more like, um, like a high voltage shock to you. So it just, it's a step up 
from the low voltage to high voltage, and then you just release some potential difference across across wherever you want to shock them with. But for this capacitor, it's different kind of discharge. This one, it, you're not controlling the voltage per se, but you're controlling, but I mean, it has some potential difference across it anyway. But the idea is, is you start with a tons of charge and it's ready to go away. So that's what it is. Ah, okay. Why did it explode? I'm not so sure about what the explosion that you're talking about means, but what I'm thinking, usually you cannot overcharge it because when you overcharge, I mean, there's no overcharge because capacitor will have the maximum value of it. So when you, when you say you overcharge, mean you supply maybe too much voltage across, across the, the, the uh, given specification then you will destroy or maybe you sort of like you make the material inside that change the properties. I think that's a problem. All right. And back in the day, um, the material in there could be like a liquid phase material. So those has a tendency to, you know, maybe evaporate and then it's just like burst out from the casing and it turns out to look like an explosion. Okay. But I think... Um, for a modern capacitor, now they use like a ceramic, uh, ceramic type material. So if you still like in the business of doing like um, some electrical devices and all this stuff, there will be some advertisement in the front of the packaging saying that it uses like a pure solid state capacitor or something like that. So if you use that kind of thing, then uh, it will have less problematic about explosion. The bad thing was just maybe just burn it and it's just that. Okay. Or you might have seen in the past, like in the old capacitor, there will be some like some liquid oozing out from the capacitor. That's because they use liquid as some material that we're going to discuss in a little bit inside the capacitor. All right. So just make sure, guys, if you see this big capacitor, and usually, I mean, the easiest place that you can find this is in like a, um, the, uh, the, 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 what, what do you call that one? The compressor? No, it's the it's a coil outside the air conditioner. And uh, inside that circuit, there will be like a big uh, capacitor. And sometimes you don't know, has it been properly discharged or not? So just make sure that you don't touch two poles or two ends of those capacitors. That could be very, very dangerous. Okay. All right. Just Just be safe, you know when you play with the capacitor, all right? It's kind of like, we don't know. And it, it can store charge for a long, long time, okay? Because sometimes when you're not hooking up into a circuit or anything, the charge just still in there, okay? All right, so this is it, guys. Just for this part of the problem, I'm just going to show you the whole process of come up with the capacitance of a type of capacitor. When I say a type of capacitor is, we're going to look at this one in particular. Okay, even though you can still play with the Gauss's law with other high symmetric problems, for example, a spherical capacitor, that's possible, or cylindrical capacitor. All right, but just to make materials kind of like soft and user friendly, <laughs> like a student friendly. So we are not going to try to do um, like a cylindrical type here because, I mean, you're going to have to learn Gauss's law in a different shape. But because you have already learned, the spherical one, I think this, I'm going to put it in the exam. Does that sound good? So you can practice what we have done like five times earlier. Plus, you can apply the concepts of the potential difference that we already learned weeks ago and combine it with the definition of the capacitance. So what we are going to focus on is going to be two types. It's either a simple, super simple one, just bringing two plates. Like you have two plates two conducting plates side by side. And then you can just like, okay, put one into a positive one, put the other one into a negative one. So you accomplish a capacitor. Or you have like two concentric spherical conducting shell. So you have an inner shell and the outer shell. Once you put the inner shell to be positive and the outer shell to be negative. So also you also accomplish the capacitor construction. Okay, does that sound reasonable? All right, so let's take a look. How can you figure out 
the capacitance of these two shapes of a capacitor using everything that we have learned. Is this is amazing. So the way that we're going to, I sort of like break it down, uh, break it down into three steps. First, apply Gauss's law to figure out the electric field. So imagine this. I think you start to feel okay now. If you put the positive in the top plate and the negative in the bottom plate, this is the part that you learn so many times that electric field should point downward quite uniformly, right? We did this simulation back a week ago. But of course, toward the end, it will have some like, you know, some curve and other stuff, all right? So let's ignore that, all right? So let's assume that, okay, there will be some curved electric field lines at the edge of this capacitor. But assume that everything is pretty smooth and everything. So that's one thing that we can kind of like calculate very easily. And the other one, when you look at this one, okay, oh, it's a sapphire. So that means electric field should just point out in the radio direction. But then because you have two sphere, one is positive, one is negative. So it's no doubt. The electric field will just come out from the positive inside and just going out to the negative one outside. Yeah. As, I mean, the shape of the whole thing looks pretty good and supposed to be very easy to calculate. Let's do that. All right. And once we understand this and then we're done. Okay. So what I'm going to show you starting from this. All right. So because we're going to have a two parallel plates. So what I'm going to show you is just looking at one plate that is positive. Let's look at the positive plates. Okay. And just to make things simple, we just assume that this is like super thin first. Super, super thin. Positive. Sheet of charge. What kind of Gaussian surface should you use? Uh, uh, no, yeah, well, you can call this a ball capacitor though. <laughs> That's a spherical shape to be a ball. Okay, so from the look of it, but hey, Dan, if you come up with a plate, we already sort of like saw this simulation a couple of times that the electric field that coming out of it should point out in a, oh, let me use blue for this, in a smooth uniform dimension, yeah, uh, direction, yeah sort of like we agree with that. Does that make sense? Okay. We ignore the end's effect because at the end it's going to curve and stuff. But if you look at the, the main region of this plate that has a positively charge on it, electric field should just come out straight. And because this is just a flat piece of charge, so this thing will happen on the back too. So there'll be the same things happen toward the back side. There'll be electric field that going in both directions. Just go backward too. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. So that means if you look sideways, electric field will come out in both sides. So just to make things nice, I mean, Mojan, what kind of Gaussian surface should we pick? Because it's come out so smoothly on the left and the right. If I imagine, I can just do this, guys. I'm just draw a box. Why not? With me? This is all the techniques that we have trying to do. And then I'm doing the same thing backward too. So on the other side of this one, I will draw the box as well. Cool. Why do I like this? Because if you look sideways, so let me put on the side. So it will look like this, guys. Look at this. So I'm just going to use the bottom figure for now. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So if I use this figure, and I forget about the drawing that it has on there first for now. So there will be an electric field pointing in both directions, right? Okay. Everywhere, like that. Very good. So because I draw the box on both sides, so my box will look just like this. Exactly the same as I just reuse part of that drawing. There you go. It will look like this. With me, that's a side view of this. And the good thing about this one is there will be only two surfaces that has some flux going through. It's just the front surface right there on this surface right there. And just the one on the back. Because at the surfaces, I mean, electric field does not penetrate. So electric field won't go on the side surfaces at all. 
So that makes your flux calculation very easy. And บอกอาจารย์ why do you have to pick, pick like a like a rectangle cross section? Well, no, I don't need. I can put a circle cross section if I want. I can put like a heart shape. <laughs> It doesn't matter. You can put any shape you like because the net flux that going to go through is going to have only this surface right here. Yeah, let me put black on here, and just the one on the back that I put black over there. One more time. There you go. All right, got that one. So these are the only two surfaces that has a non-zero flux. So let's imagine electric field is trying to get out here. See, electric field point to your right. The area vector of that surface is also point to your right. With me, guys, isn't that simple? So that make the flux. Let me call this flux on the right surface. Is going to be e times a, guys, and it's done. Okay. Simple. Look on the left. Well, a j a n same scenario. Electric field will point to the left. The area vector will also point to the left. So the a vector and the e vector pointing in the same direction again. So the flux on the left is also e a. Woohoo! So, what is the net flux? So, I would say the net flux is going to be flux on the top. Top mean that I mean you know, the side, the bottom, everywhere. But what you have over here is you only or did <laughs> my slide call the top and the bottom, but it's supposed to be left and right. So, let me rephrase this one as a right. <laughs> my bad, and the left. That's weird. Why I call top and bottom? Well. I mean, is you tilt your head? That is fine. <laughs> okay, so it's gonna be the right, the side, and the left. Okay, and what you have over here is that a j a n There's nothing much to it. It's only right and left. So what I'm doing over here is the net flux is going to be E A. That's from the left. Plus E A. That's from the right. So it's gonna be two A, two E A. And then all I need to do is just equate that to charge that this one in close divided by epsilon naught, and I'm done. How much charge you have, m o j a n Zoom in. The charge that you are enclosing is just only the charge on the plate that is inside this box right here, this Gaussian surface that you built. You guys with me now? Only the charge is in here that I care. Outside, I don't care. So, how much charge is this one? So, usually, it's a two-dimensional sheet of charge. So, you can define sigma. We saw rho before. Rho was just the charge per volume. This one is a charge per surface area. So, because you have the area surface A on the left, on the right, of course, it's going to be the same area inside as well. So the net charge that you can place on here is going to be sigma a. You guys with me? The charge is just the density times the area. So it just put sigma a in there. So that's it, guys. So follow me here a little bit. Almost done. Almost done. So I got two e a equal to sigma a over epsilon naught. So my a cancel. So what I have left is e is just sigma over two epsilon naught, and I'm done. Okay. So the reason that I show you this because it's different from the slide. <laughs> the slide has missing two. b o j a n what you're doing over here? Is you have like two all over the place, but the slide doesn't show up the number two. What's missing? This is what happening here, guys. What I show you just so you can see how to apply Gauss's law in the case of just like a plate. Okay, like a sheet of charge, but in reality, you are building a capacitor from a conducting plate. It's a real plate. Like you cannot build like a super thin charge that has like charge floating in the air or something like. You cannot do that. So in reality, what happened was the bottom figure, guys. All right, I'm just gonna have to erase everything now. 
the real scenario over here is it's not this. I'm going to have to get this all away. Why? Look at this. It's going to be a real metal. You probably use like copper, aluminum, or whatever. And inside that one is the conductor now. You guys with me? One more time. So your friend's question is very good. So in general, usually you cannot just keep charge charges on a piece of stuff that is conducting to stay in place. You guys with me? Okay, think about this one more time. S stick with me here. <laughs> Almost done. If this room is a piece of copper, so think of it like a solid piece of copper. I am swimming in the copper. I am a charged particle. Let's say I'm positive charge, even though in reality I'm supposed to be electrons. All right, but anyway, let's say I'm a, a positive charge floating around. And I'm going to have like positive charge, my friends that are positively charged, like a Vogado number, right? We're going to have like million, million, million of charges in this, you know, sea of copper space and all this stuff. Where should I go at the end? What do you think? Yeah, I'm going to start on the surface. Why? Because I cannot stay in the middle of the copper. I have like million friends of me pushing me from the Coulomb's law. They are positively charged. So the only place that the positive charge can stop moving, be peaceful with my life is just, I'm just going to have my back against the wall or maybe against the ceiling or against the wall, uh, the floor. Because that is where I am being pushed and I cannot get pushed any further. I'm stuck on the surface. Does that make sense? <laughs> I cannot go anywhere. I mean, I'm talking about when I'm done with moving. Because if I'm starting at the middle of the copper block, I'm going to get pushed by Coulomb's law. And then eventually I'm going to stuck somewhere, let's say on the wall. And I'm just going to rearrange on the wall a little bit until I find my place and then I stop. Everybody will do the same thing. So that means at the end, the charge on the conducting plate will only reside on the surface. You guys with me now? That's what it is. And if you imagine that this piece of the whole thing has, it's supposed to be like a big piece. So that means this room will be surrounded by charged particle. But inside, there will be no charge. You guys with me? We already discussed this from Gauss's law. See? The case that you are inside a spherical shell of charge. Electric field in here is zero. With me now? Same thing will happen here. Electric field inside this copper room will be zero because charges are on the surface only. So this is the reason why this figure that you're looking over here, it say electric field is zero inside the conducting metal. And that's why the factor of two just disappear because you only have electric field pointing in outside direction, not the inside. And that's conclude why the electric field supposed to go only sigma over epsilon naught. And that is okay. So I know it's um this way of approaching this topic is kind of like I it's it's supposed to like we're supposed to spend like maybe three weeks doing this, but because well as I said, this is toward the ends of the whole thing. Then and I try to give you, I know it's like a lot of information flowing, but I try to give you some relationship between some exercises that we have done. So I hope this is it's like a compact way of introducing the conducting plate capacitor. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, but the whole metal can be negatively. I mean, yeah, you can do positive or negative. It's going to be the same. I mean, um, if you have surplus, negatively charged, then negatively charged will reside on the surface anyway. So the key conclusion of this one is when you have a conducting material, that's it. The charge will be located on the surface only. There won't be any charge inside. Okay, sounds good. All right. So that's give you a conclusion that here, I can draw a simple diagram now. So I'm happy from the Gauss's law that every time you have a parallel plate capacitor, you can imagine that electric field yeah, coming out from a plate is going to be just purely simple disk. 
sigma over epsilon naught. Isn't that nice? The nice thing about this one is you don't have any a function of x, function of r, or anything. It's a constant electric field. So that's why we can draw like a, just a, like a straight line. It feels like, like a gravity field, okay? So the strength of the electric field can be tuned by changing the density of the charge on that plate, and that's it. That's the only way that you can manipulate it. Cool? All right, once you have this, that's my first step down. So the first step of this three steps process is just to figure out what should be the electric field inside the capacitor. So that's first one done. Now you will see everything will be easy from now on. Second step, you already learned how to calculate the potential difference from the field. Remember the negative sign because we already agree that every time you go against the field, you're going toward the higher potential. But because you figure out that, hey, Dan, we remember this case. This is a simple case. It's a constant electric field. Okay? So in that case, the potential difference is just ED. We remember that because it's like MGH that you throw away the M. It's just G times the H. So that means if you know the separation between the plates and you know the size of the electric field, the potential difference is just going to be E times D. And that's it. It's going to be D sigma over epsilon naught. Second step's done. <laughs> Isn't that cool? All right. And the last step is the easiest one. You just apply the, the definition of the capacitor. Uh, the capacitance is just a ratio between the charge over the voltage difference. So let's try this and see how it goes. C is just going to be the charge. Whoa, 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 the charge. We don't know yet. Let's put Q in there. Divided by the potential difference, you already got it from the second step. So it's going to be sigma D over epsilon naught. But about John, wait a second. We already learned that the sigma is just a charge per unit area. So actually, if you can imagine that this is like a plate with the sigma on it, or I, I should draw a little bit better. I'm sorry, sorry. That's my bad. Here. Okay, here we go. There you go. Hey, why don't you change the color? There you go. All right, that looks better. Sorry. There you go. All right, so if you imagine that this is a real plate, like perspectively, like that, with the cross-sectional area or the plate area to be A, and you know that the charge density is sigma, so the amount of charge on that one is going to be sigma A. So I can turn this into sigma A, and the sigma will cancel. So that's it, guys. I can flip the epsilon naught to the top with the A and the D, and that's it. I get this one. Done. Okay. okay. So I hope this sort of like give you a sense of like why do we build like all the definitions, <laughs> how to define electric field, link to the potential difference, and then Gauss's law that helps you evaluate the electric field and all be combined in applying in the capacitance calculation of a capacitor. So that's what it is. I don't know. It looks, I think this is like a cool application of what we have been learning about electricity. Sounds like a good thing. <laughs> I know it's too much, but anyway, okay. Good stuff about this one is look at the final results, guys. Look at this. See, it depends only on the shape of the capacitor. How big is the plate? That's the A. And what is the separation between the plate? That is the D. See? And nothing else. And that's what this thing is so cool about the capacitance. It does not depend on the potential difference that you apply. It doesn't, I mean, it's not related to resistance or whatsoever. It's only the physical change that you need. And of course, you might still thinking of like, oh, Dan, we still have epsilon naught. And of course. So that means if you can change some of this, that's going to be the only things that you can do to change the capacitance of it. Okay. All right. That's kind of cool. Okay. What is if the play is not smooth? <laughs> All right. Um, just find a smooth one then, I think. <laughs> just make it too hard. Okay. So 
Um, if it's not smooth, then you do computer simulation. I think that's much better, right? You need some detail there. But anyway, the point is the application of this that you can relate to is your keyboard, guys. The keyboard, I don't know, do I have that here? Okay, no, I don't. Okay, anyway, I thought I have a figure. But anyway, keyboard, if you notice that keyboard do not use the electricity, you don't have to do it. I mean, you just press the button and it works, all right? You, can, you don't even have to use like anything to drive it. Because every time you press the key, keyboard, the structure inside the keyboard is actually is a parallel plate capacitor. So every time you press on it, you change the D. And every time you change the D, the C will change. And then all the computer need to know is just like which key that has the capacitance change and they know which key is being pressed. See, that's simple. And your smartphone, if you look at the box for the specification, I think everyone, may, I don't know, they dropped this word or not, but they say it's a capacity touch screen. So the touch screen using the capacity property of it as well, because when having the finger around and not having the finger around will have the different value of the C. So you can imagine like you, even though you don't change the A, you don't change the D, but having your finger around, it seems like it changed the epsilon naught. All right, but the idea of epsilon naught may be a little weird at this point, but the whole idea is what you have at this point is just saying that environmental change, physical change, are the only things that are going to change the C, not the circuits, not the voltage different apply, nothing else. Okay, just gonna be some physical changes that will determine the value of the capacitance. All right, so I hope that sort of gives you some relationship why. Now, it doesn't really matter when you have a glass surface on top because all you care about is with the finger, not finger, you don't have to touch it, you just have to be around to make the environment change the C will change. And that leads to multi-touch, pinch, zoom, and all this stuff that Apple patented and everything, okay? Before that, this, we had like a Nintendo DS, if you play that one with the pen that you have to press on the screen and then the screen would sort of bend down a little bit. It's kind of soft and everything. The Nintendo DS, that was the resistive touch screen. So that's why you have to press it pretty hard to make a dent on it and the resistance change. But the bad thing about this one is you cannot put a glass on top because glass cannot be bent. So you sacrifice the, the clarity of the figure because you have to use plastic on top. So it's look like, you know, it's like a matte finish and all this stuff. It doesn't look so nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If both plates touch and charge equalize, yes, <laughs> that's not good. You get a short circuit. All right. And we will discuss that uh, in the afternoon session if you're still around. Okay, so we'll have another thing to do is, of course, we're not going to just like a leave blank stuff between the plates. So we're just going to fill something in between. And it will serve two purposes. Of course, one purpose is so these two plates won't touch easily. And second thing is by squeezing something in between, you can adjust the epsilon knot and use it to enhance the C without changing the physical distance or the plate size and all that stuff. Okay, sounds like a good one. All right. So, all right, I'm just going to give you an idea of the final question in the exam. I think I do this every year, every trimester. I'm going to ask you to figure out the capacitance of a spherical capacitor. I'm just give, right, sort of like spoil you with the, the question in the final exam. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to calculate using, using this three-step process to find out what is the capacitance of a spherical capacitor and that's it okay it's supposed to be in the textbook already so this one is like sort of like giving away points and for the cylindrical don't worry about it i don't think because we don't have a lot of time for you to absorb this kind of like gauss's law application and everything so it's going to be too much work for you to try to familiarize yourself with the concepts in either shape so i don't think i'm going to sort of like put you through the cylindrical symmetry of the problem okay so sounds fair all right, so stick with just what we have been doing. We did this five times for the spherical symmetry. So I'm going to only ask you to figure out the capacitance of a spherical capacitor using the same three steps process and everything that we have learned in the past. And this one will be show up in the final exam. Sounds good? All right, okay, guys. Okay. Thank you. I think that's 
pretty much close down this chapter over here. Okay. And uh, I have like a, another session in the afternoon. So what I really want to do in the afternoon is just uh, talk about what to put in here. And just a simple circuit analysis. It, it's a trick that is kind of like, it seems useful, seems to me, that I think it's a good place to stop the course. So that's why I just like, uh, sort of like, I'm gonna just do, just, it's gonna take like maybe just an hour, let's say have a session, okay? Sounds like a good plan. All right, if you guys can make it in the afternoon, that is fine. If not, that's okay, because I'm going to do the recording anyway. All right, so any of you will show up again around, maybe let's do it about like 12.30. Sounds, if you up for it. If not, that is okay. I, I really feel grateful already, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> Stick around to the end. All right, guys. So if you have a chance, just maybe drop by 12.30. Sounds good. All right, but if not, just catch up on the YouTube playlist. Sounds like a plan. Okay, guys. So thank you. And that is it for this lecture.